Have you seen the Statue of Liberty? It is one of the most enduring symbols of the United States of America. It emerged from the circumstances where the basic rights of people were being denied vehemently. This makes the Statue of Liberty a perfect symbol of freedom. The concepts of liberty, equality, and fraternity were touchstones of the French Revolution. This is a famous piece called Universal Democratic and Social Republic by French artist Frédéric Soran. He had visualized a utopian world made up of democratic and social republics. Now, a utopian vision is the vision of a perfect society that is so ideal that it is unlikely to actually exist. If you look carefully, Soran shows people from different countries and all walks of life marching towards the Statue of Liberty, each of them wearing their national costume and carrying revolutionary flags. The countries leading the procession are the United States and Switzerland. They are followed by the French people, carrying the revolutionary tricolor. France has just reached the Statue of Liberty. By this time, the revolution had taken place in France. France is followed by the German people with their flag. Other countries of Europe, such as Sicily, Lombardy, Poland, England, Ireland, Hungary and Russia are behind Germany. The rubble in the foreground signifies the end of absolutist institutions and monarchy. Absolutism can be defined as a government or a system of rule with a lot of uncontrolled power. It also refers to an oppressive monarchical government. Another remarkable part of this print is the angels, saints and Christ, who are looking at these groups of people. It seems that they are showering their blessings on them. Soro has used Christ and the angels to emphasize the fraternity among the nations of the world. This print is path-breaking as it reflects the mood of the times and forebodes an era of revolutions that marked Europe during the 19th century. During the 19th century, Europe was undergoing a phase of transition. The long-oppressed peasantry had begun to question the landed aristocracy and the feudal system. On the other hand, rapid industrialization had given birth to the middle class, consisting of industrialists, businessmen and professionals. In the wake of these changes, the educated liberal-minded middle class wanted to overthrow the absolutist rulers. This mindset of bringing together people with a shared past, history and culture gave rise to the idea of the nation-state. The first visible expression of nationalism ever was the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789. As a mark of protest, many agitated and oppressed people of France stormed the fortress prison, Bastille. The major outcome of the revolution was the formation of a constitutional monarchy and a sizable reduction in the royal and feudal privileges. Let us now take a look at the impact of the French Revolution. 
It paved the way for the achievement of bigger goals of national identity and national pride, which can be aptly called nationalism. The revolutionaries refer to France as la patrie or the fatherland, where all citizens, known as le citoyen, enjoyed equal rights under the constitution. Some major steps were taken by the revolutionaries to establish a feeling of nationhood and a collective French identity. To commemorate this significant historical event, a new design for the French national flag was adopted. The new design represented the pride and honor of belonging to a free nation. To invoke nationalism, Several hymns and songs were composed, and oaths were taken. The martyrs of the French Revolution were commemorated. French was adopted as the common language of France, and the use of regional dialects was discouraged. The French Revolution had its impact on the administration as well. A body of active citizens, or the citizens who were allowed to vote because they paid taxes, elected the Estates General and renamed it the National Assembly. A centralized administrative system was created. This system formulated uniform laws for all French citizens. All internal custom duties and dues were abolished. A uniform system of weights and measures was adopted. Did you know that the metric system that we use today was founded by France in 1791? The French Revolution inspired people all over Europe to begin movements against autocracy and despotism. The French revolutionaries also took it upon themselves to help other European countries in their struggle to overcome autocracy and form nations. Students and the middle classes formed Jacobin clubs in many European countries. Due to this widespread enthusiasm, the French armies were welcomed by European countries such as Holland, Belgium, Switzerland and Italy in the 1790s. The era after the French Revolution saw the emergence of a famous historic personality, a warrior known as Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon was a man of great conviction. He is well known for his imperialistic motives and conquests in Europe. Napoleon observed the chaotic situation after the French Revolution and exploited it to the maximum to achieve his imperialistic aspirations. Democracy received a setback during his time as he returned to monarchy. On the flip side, he introduced several effective administrative changes. The Civil Code of 1804 introduced by Napoleon is also known as the Napoleonic Code. It is famous for the administrative changes brought about by Napoleon. As per this code, Napoleon abolished the privileges enjoyed by the noblemen and clergy on the basis of birth. He brought in equality before law and secured the right to property, much to the relief of the general gentry. The Napoleonic Code was carried to other countries of Europe that were brought under French control, such as the Dutch Republic, Switzerland, Italy and Germany. The feudal system was abolished and the peasants were freed from serfdom and the payment of dues to the manor owner. In the towns, Napoleon removed guild restrictions 
and improve the transport and communication systems. The businessmen and small producers of goods felt that uniform laws, standardized weights, and a common national currency could facilitate free trade across Europe. The people of the countries under the French rule soon realized that the changes in the administrative arena were just an eyewash. They had virtually lost their political freedom that had been attained after a lot of effort. Higher taxes forced enrollment of people into the French army and censorship overshadowed the positive administrative changes brought about by Napoleon and led to his downfall. During the mid-18th century, the European countries were not as we know them today. Europe was divided into several small kingdoms and principalities. The concept of nation-states did not exist at all. Some of the prominent empires in Europe were the autocratic Ottoman Empire that ruled over Eastern and Central Europe and Greece, and the Habsburg Empire that ruled over Austria, Hungary. Due to the cultural differences amongst the European people, there was no political unity and no clear concept of a nation. However, the difference in cultural background and the desire to use the ideas of the French Revolution led people towards a common goal, nationalism. During the 19th century, the landed aristocracy was a small but influential class in Europe. This class dominated the social as well as political spheres and was desperately trying to regain its position. Members of this class all over Europe were connected to each other because of their similar way of life and intermarriages. They owned large estates in the countryside and townhouses. French was a common language spoken by them for diplomacy and high society. Interestingly though, the majority of the European population was made up of peasants and serfs. In Western Europe, most of the land was tilled by tenants and small owners, while in Central and Eastern Europe, estates were cultivated by serfs. With the advent of industrialization in the late 18th and 19th centuries, new social groups came into existence. These were the working class population and the middle class. Both these groups depended on market production for their livelihood. The middle class had a free-thinking liberal mindset. The ideas of nationalism led them towards a far-fetched aim to bridge the gap between aristocracy and other classes. They hoped to end the autocratic rule and wanted to form a national government of the people. The educated middle class of Europe was deeply influenced with the notion of liberty from the French Revolution. As a result, the concept of liberalism was born. The word liberalism traces its roots to the Latin word liber, meaning free. The middle class believed in the need for freedom and equality of all individuals before law. On the political front, liberalism referred to government by consent. The liberals also stressed that private property should not be violated. Although liberalism popularized the idea of a people's government, the right to vote or suffrage was not extended to all citizens. On the economic front, liberalism implied freedom of markets, and free movement of goods and capital. The Napoleonic Code had tried to facilitate it. However, this code was not practiced in totality. Let's see why. During the 19th century, freedom of movement of goods and capital became a strong demand of the emerging middle class. The Napoleonic Code 
though revolutionary for its time, was unable to address the growing needs of the industrialists. To complicate matters, each region had its own system of weights and measures. These situations posed encumbrances for economic growth and exchange. The middle class argued for the creation of a unified economic territory to facilitate unhindered movement of goods, people and capital. In 1834, a customs union, or Zolverin, was formed at the initiative of Prussia and joined by most of the German states. This union eliminated tariff barriers and reduced the number of currencies from over 30 to 2. Apart from this, a railway network was initiated, which enhanced mobility and communication between the economies. All these changes helped in the growth of nationalist sentiments. You have read earlier that during the 19th century, the upcoming middle class had tasted the ideas of liberalism. Liberalism was used by them as a tool to end aristocracy and clerical privileges. Another crucial event of this time was the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte at Waterloo in 1815. This steered the European governments towards adopting the idea of conservatism. Let us understand the term conservatism. It was a political philosophy that steered the importance of tradition, established institutions and customs, and preferred gradual development rather than quick change. The conservatives believed that established traditional institutions of state and society, like monarchy, church, social hierarchies, property and family, must be protected and preserved. At the same time, they did not propose a return to the pre-revolutionary period. They firmly believed that the aristocratic monarchies of Europe could gain a lot from a modern army, an efficient bureaucracy, a dynamic economy, and the abolition of feudalism and serfdom. During his conquests, Napoleon had annexed several kingdoms and made them a part of France. In 1815, after the defeat of Napoleon, the representatives of European powers, namely Austria, Britain, Prussia and Russia, met at Vienna. This meeting is also known as the Treaty or Congress of Vienna. The chief architect and host of this treaty was the Austrian Chancellor, Duke Metternich. The purpose of this treaty was to undo all the territorial changes that had taken place during the Napoleonic Wars and create a new conservative order in Europe. As a result, the Bourbon dynasty, deposed during the French Revolution, was restored to power. This was just to convey to the people that royalty and aristocracy was back and here to stay. Besides, France lost most of the territories it had gained during Napoleon's time. To prevent the expansion of France in the future, certain states were set up along the boundaries of France. Interestingly, the German Confederation of 39 states, set up by Napoleon, was not touched at all during this division. The conservative regimes set up through the Treaty of Vienna in 1815 were autocratic in nature. They tried to curb the freedom of expression and imposed censorship laws on newspapers, books, plays and songs as they championed freedom. Let's now find out the reaction of the liberals to conservatism. The liberals were not happy with the autocratic ways of the conservatives. They raised their voice against the censorship of the press. After 1815, 
several liberals began working in secret societies all over Europe to propagate their views and train revolutionaries. The liberals, on the other hand, wanted to overthrow the monarchical structures that had been formed after the Vienna Congress. They realized that to overthrow the autocratic conservative order, the creation of nation states was essential. The famous Italian revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini was a man of such revolutionary ideas. He was part of a secret society called Carboneri. Mazzini founded two underground societies called Young Italy in Marseille and Young Europe in Bern. Mazzini believed in the unification of the small kingdoms and principalities in Italy. The period between 1830 and 1848 was marked by a lot of tensions and turmoil. Earlier, Europe had witnessed the dramatic rise of two philosophies, liberalism and conservatism. The liberal nationalists or the educated middle class planned ways to overthrow monarchy and bring in a government of the people. The relentless efforts of the liberals began to bear fruit and Europe saw a series of revolutions in Italy, Germany, Poland, Turkey and Ireland. In 1821, a significant event mobilized nationalist feelings among the educated class in Europe. This was the Greek War of Independence. The Greeks struggled against the autocratic Ottoman Muslim Empire and began a nationalist movement. After the war, the Treaty of Constantinople was signed in 1832. It recognized Greece as an independent nation. In 1830, the Bourbon dynasty, restored in 1815 during the Conservatives' reaction, was overthrown by liberal revolutionaries. The French Revolution of 1830 is also known as the July Revolution. Inspired by the French or July Revolution, Belgium broke away from the United Kingdom of the Netherlands. In the 19th century, art, culture and literature helped in instilling the feelings of nationalism and also infusing the idea of a nation. During this time, artists, poets and writers made efforts to create a sense of shared collective heritage, a common cultural past as the basis of a nation. Writers, poets, painters and musicians of the Romantic era stressed on individualism, nationalism, feeling, imagination and emotion as opposed to reason and science. Romanticism can be defined as an artistic, literary and intellectual movement that originated in this turbulent phase of political upheaval. German Romantic philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder stressed that true German culture could be found in folklore and folk art, which lay with the common people or das Volk. Another example is the Grimm Brothers' fairy tales. 
Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm were born in Germany. The Grimm brothers believed that collecting German folk tales and popularizing German was a way of reinforcing the German identity. The revival of popular folk art forms and language helped people to identify with the cause of nationalism. Let us take a look at the social condition of Europe. The years after 1830 were marked by a lot of anarchy and chaos. During this time, Europe witnessed the worst period ever of hunger and hardship. Bad harvest and a rise in food prices added to people's woes. In the first half of the 19th century, the population of Europe had increased a lot. This led to unemployment. Many people migrated from the rural areas to the growing slums in the cities. On the other hand, due to the growth of industrialization in England, small producers in towns faced stiff competition from cheap machine-made goods. An important event of this time was the revolt of the Silesian weavers against their contractors in 1845. The peasants stormed into the contractor's mansion, demanding their rights. In France, food shortage led to the peasants' uprising in 1848. To pacify the people, the National Assembly granted suffrage to males about 20 years of age, and national workshops were set up to provide employment. The history of Europe between 1830 and 1848 is lined with many revolts and uprisings. There were rebellions by peasants and workers against exploitation, and the liberals were staging rebellions driven by the ideology of nationalism. An ideology is a system of ideas reflecting a particular social and political vision. Let's understand how the liberal middle class gave shape to the revolutions. Inspired by France, in Germany, Italy, Poland, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, men and women of the liberal middle class began demanding a constitution and national unification. In Germany, Many political associations made up of the middle class and the working class came together in Frankfurt to vote for an all-German national assembly. On the 18th of May, 1948, the Frankfurt Parliament was convened in the Church of St. Paul. The middle class dominated the Parliament and did not accept the demands of artisans and peasants, and so eventually lost their support. As a result, the army had to intervene to settle the dispute and the assembly itself was dissolved. Though the conservatives managed to suppress liberal movements, they could not establish the old order. After 1848, the autocratic monarchies of Central and Eastern Europe realized that they had to coexist with liberal nationalist revolutionaries. After all, that was the only way of arriving at a peaceful situation conducive for development. This was just the beginning. More changes were waiting to come in the future. Despite upholding the concept of universal freedom, the liberal revolutionaries 
exhibited narrow-mindedness in their attitude towards women. Since the French Revolution, women played an active role in revolts and popular movements. They founded newspapers and political associations, but suffrage and political rights still eluded them. The Frankfurt Parliament is an example where women merely acted as spectators in the upper left gallery. Luckily, there were people who came to the rescue of women's rights. Famous political activist Louise Otto Peters wrote in the first editorial of her newspaper that liberty without the liberty of women benefited only one half of humanity, which was men. This awareness of women's rights, based on political and social equality of genders, is also known as feminism. Early revolutions in Europe upheld the ideas of democracy and liberal nationalism. After 1848, the conservatives began to use nationalist ideas to strengthen the monarchy. In fact, the unification of Italy and Germany came about through this process. In 1848, the German middle class, professionals, businessmen, wealthy artists and artisans had joined hands to vote for an all-German national assembly. They convened at the Frankfurt Parliament. The members of the Parliament offered the crown to Frederick Wilhelm IV, King of Prussia, who rejected it as he did not want subjugation to the Parliament. The Frankfurt Parliament was crushed by the monarchy and army, which was supported by the Prussian landowners called Junkers. After the Frankfurt Parliament, Prussia became the leader of German unification. The man who played a crucial role in the unification was the chief minister of Prussia, Otto von Bismarck. Bismarck was supported by the bureaucracy and the army. To achieve German unification, three wars were fought over a period of seven years between 1864 and 1870. Finally, Prussia emerged victorious and the unification was completed. On the 18th of January, 1871, the King of Prussia, Kaiser William I, was proclaimed the German Emperor at the Mirror Hall in Versailles. Thereafter, the process of nation-building began in the newly formed German state. Emphasis was placed on modernizing the currency and the banking, legal and judicial systems. Measures and practices of old Prussia were adopted for the rest of Germany. Italy had a long history of political fragmentation too. During the middle of the 19th century, Italy was divided into seven states. Northern Italy was ruled by the Austrian part of the Habsburg Empire. Central Italy was ruled by the Pope. While the southern part and Parma came under the Bourbon kings of Spain. Only one state, Sardinia Piedmont was ruled by an Italian princely house. There were a few key people who shaped the revolution and unification in Italy. Mazzini was the leader of the Republican Party. He had formed secret societies like Young Italy to regenerate Italy by education. However, the rebellion staged by the revolutionaries. Thereafter, the responsibility of unifying Italy 
came to Victor Emmanuel II, King of Sardinia, Piedmont. The Chief Minister of Piedmont, Count Camillo di Cavour, helped the King in forming an alliance with France, and they defeated the Austrian forces in 1859. Another person who played an important role was Giuseppe Garibaldi. He joined the war along with his armed volunteers called the Red Shirts. In 1860, Garibaldi and his troops drove out the Spanish rulers. In 1861, Victor Emmanuel II was announced King of United Italy. In Britain, the formation of nation-state did not happen due to a sudden upheaval or revolution like the other parts of Europe. Rather, it was the result of a long drawn-out process. The British Isles was inhabited by ethnic groups such as the English, Welsh, Scots and Irish. These groups had their own cultural and political traditions. The concept of nation-states with England as the center came about in 1688 after the Parliament snatched power from the monarchy. In 1707, the Act of Union between England and Scotland resulted in the formation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. To ensure the growth of British identity, Scotland's culture and political institutions were suppressed. The Catholic Scottish Highlanders were forced not to talk in their native language, Gaelic, and weren't allowed to wear their national dress. The British imposed control over Ireland as well. Ireland had two dominant groups, Catholics and Protestants. The English favoured the Protestants, and the British helped them to dominate a largely Catholic Ireland. Several Catholic rebellions in Ireland were crushed brutally. Wolf Tone, also known as the father of Irish republicanism, revolted against the British but failed. In 1801, Ireland was forcibly incorporated into the United Kingdom. The symbols of New Britain were the English language, the British flag, the Union Jack and the British National Anthem. The fall of the Bastille has become a popular symbol of people conquering tyranny. A symbol is a visual image that represents something other than itself. It may be a representation using an object, picture, written word, sound or a particular mark. Here are some symbols that all of us come across every day. During the 18th and the 19th centuries, several symbols were used by artists and revolutionaries to depict abstract concepts. These symbols were usually popular images from everyday life that uneducated masses could easily identify with. Despite upholding the concept of universal freedom, the liberal revolutionaries exhibited narrow-mindedness in their attitude towards women. Since the French Revolution, women played an active role in revolts and popular movements. They founded newspapers and political associations, but suffrage and political rights still eluded them. The Frankfurt Parliament is an example where women merely acted as spectators in the upper left gallery. Luckily, there were people who came to the rescue of women's rights. Famous political activist Louise Otto Peters wrote in the first editorial of her newspaper that 
liberty without the liberty of women benefited only one half of humanity, which was men. This awareness of women's rights, based on political and social equality of genders, is also known as feminism. If we recollect, after 1871, there was a significant change in the concept of nationalism in Europe. It no longer embodied the liberal nationalist ideas of the past. Nationalist groups in Europe still upheld the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity. However, they had become increasingly incompatible with each other and were constantly in conflict. This was a favorable situation for major European powers, namely Russia, Germany, England, and Austro-Hungary. They began taking advantage of nationalism in Europe to materialize their aims for imperialism. Let's understand the meaning of imperialism. It refers to the policy of extending the rule and the authority of an empire or nation over foreign countries or of acquiring and holding colonies and dependencies. The European powers cited the much disturbed Balkan region to fulfill their imperialist goals. Let's understand a little more about the Balkan region. Balkan is an old Turkish word meaning a chain of wooded mountains. The Balkans region consisted of the following countries of our times. Romania Bulgaria, Albania, Greece, Macedonia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Slovenia, Serbia, and Montenegro. People of the Balkans were collectively known as Slavs. The spread of Romantic nationalism and the downfall of the Ottoman Empire had made the Balkans Peninsula very tense and volatile. Gradually, the European subjects had begun to break away from the Ottoman Empire and had started declaring themselves independent. The Balkans claimed independence and a separate political identity based on nationality. Intensifying the tension further was the rivalry between the European powers over trade, colonies and naval and military strength. To fulfill these aims, Russia, Germany, England and Austro-Hungary wanted to extend their control over the disturbed Balkan region. Their rivalry caused many wars and culminated in the First World War. Nationalism, aligned with imperialism, led Europe to disaster in 1914. Later, the countries colonized by the European powers in the 19th century began to overthrow their imperial rule. Many countries struggled for the formation of nation-states and each country was inspired by a sense of collective national unity. Though every country developed its own specific nationalism, there was one thing in common, the idea of organizing societies as nation-states.